Welcome to Lunch of the Lord. I'm Pastor Mark. We are in Nehemiah. We're going to be looking at chapter 13 this lesson. But before we begin, Jeremiah 15, 16, thy words were found and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. Now, chapter 13 of Nehemiah deals with the, the need for purity. All right, the need for purity. And in this chapter, we're going to be seeing the, uh, the purity of different things. Purity of the people, purity of, of the temple, the purifying of these things. Now, we're going to start reading in verses 1 through 3 because these verses deal with the purifying of the people. So it says here, on that day, they read in the book of Moses in the audience of the people, and therein was found written that the Ammonite and the Moabite should not come into the congregation of God forever, because they met not the children of Israel with bread and with water, but they hired Balaam against them, that he should curse them, but our God turned the curse into a blessing. Now it came to pass when they had heard the law that they separated from Israel all the mixed multitude. Now, it says here, on that day, in verse 1, and this was not the same day as the that uh, we saw in chapter 12, the day of celebration, where they dedicated the wall unto God. But the day spoken of is took place after Nehemiah, had returned to Babylon for a while in order and got permission to return back to Jerusalem uh, after being with the king. Nehemiah was in Nehemiah was in Jerusalem for 12 years and he decided he wanted to go back to Babylon to be with the king for a while. And this is what happened. So Nehemiah, 12 years earlier, he's in the city of Shushan, where the king is, and he gets permission to go to Jerusalem and to rebuild the wall. He leaves Shushan and goes there. Now remember, it takes four to five months to travel. So four to five months to travel uh, from, from Shushan down to Babylon, I'm sorry, down to uh, Jerusalem, and then from Jerusalem back to to Shushan or back to Babylon. This, this time that Nehemiah spends with the king in Babylon, this is a this is not like a you know a weekend journey or something. This is a this is a, like a year, year and a half, maybe two years that he's away from Jerusalem. So uh, Nehemiah he, he decides he's going to leave Jerusalem after being there for 12 years and, and having the wall built and setting up the people, making sure that they learn the word of God and know God's word. He goes back to Babylon uh, to where the king is and he spends some time with the king and then the king gives him permission to leave Babylon and go back to Jerusalem. So, when Nehemiah left for Jerusalem the first time, he was in the city of Shushan. And because Shushan was considered the winter, the winter residence of the king of Persia. So Shushan was about 800 to 1,000 miles from Jerusalem. But when Nehemiah returned to the king after being there for 12 years, he goes to Babylon. We see that in chapter 13 and verse 6. So the king, when, when Nehemiah goes back to spend time with the king, now the king is in Babylon. He's not in Shushan. So Nehemiah goes to Babylon and he's, and, he's, and he's there with the king for a while. And it says here in verse 1, it says, on that day they read in the book of Moses. Now the portion that's referred to here that they read is Deuteronomy chapter 23 verses 3 through 6 and you can read that if you'd like but it basically says the same thing as what we read here in verses 1 and 2 that the Ammonite 
and the Moabite is was not allowed into the congregation of Israel because of what they what they did to the children of Israel while they were wandering in the wilderness. Now, the history of Moab is a, is a sad history, except for one bright spot. Both Moab and Ammon came into being out of a drunken, incestuous relationship that Lot had with his two daughters. If you want to read about it, you can go to Genesis chapter 19 and read verses 30 through 38. And you'll see that Lot and Moab, these, these uh, nations got their beginning from a, from a relationship that Lot had with his two daughters. Now, nothing good ever came from being drunk in the Bible. When you read in the Bible, people were drunk. It res the result was never anything good. And if you, if you don't believe me, you can ask Lot. You can ask Nadab and Abihu. You can ask Canaan. You can read Genesis 9, verses 20 through 25. Ask Canaan what happened when, when his uh, grandfather got drunk. Grandfather Noah got drunk. Ask Canaan what happened. If you don't believe me, ask Belshazzar. Read, read I think it's Daniel chapter 5. Read Belshazzar. What happened to him when he got drunk? It's better, it's better not to drink at all. It's better. Listen, when it comes down to a choice of drinking or not drinking, um, my choice is, is don't drink at all. It's better to just abstain from it all. Now, the whole history of Moab is nothing but being an enemy of their relatives, the Jews. Moab... It are it, Moab and Amma, Amnon, they are relatives to the Jewish nation because Lot, Lot was related to, to Abraham. Lot and his daughters should Lot and his daughters should have taught Moab and Ammon how much Abraham did for their father and to be respectful to Abraham's descendants because they were family. So, as, as the, these two children, Moab and Ammon, as they are children and growing up, it was the duty of, of their mothers, uh, of Lot's daughters, and also of Lot himself, to show some respect towards Abraham and his descendants. But more than likely, they didn't do it. The only bright and shining light that came out of all of the Moabites was a woman named Ruth. And because she humbled herself to the God of the Jews, God put her in the line of the Messiah. We see that in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 5. Now, concerning the Ammonites, the Ammonites were actually no different than the Moabites. They were constantly the enemies of Israel. But again, there was one bright spot in the Ammonite history. King Solomon marries an Ammonite woman, and from this union, Rehoboam is born, and Rehoboam is also in the line of Jesus. We see that in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 7. So Jesus, Jesus had some Moabite and some Ammonite in his genealogy. <laughs> you know, we, we think that God, we think that how can I say this? God isn't limited. God isn't limited in his power and who he can use. 
And you know, although there are nations that may be cursed, like the Ammonites and the Moabites, they may have, a, I don't want to say a curse, but they've been, in a sense, God spoke things against them. Yet, God in the end was merciful and gracious that in the line of Jesus, there is a Moabite and there is an Ammonite there. Even though, even though the beginning of those nations began in a sinful way, sinful, wicked way, yet God touched the hearts, moved upon the hearts of people there. And these two, these two people, these two women came out of these, these nations and God used them. God, you know, Jesus was born and he had some Ammonite in him and he had some Moabite in him. Verse 3 says, Now it came to pass when they had heard the law that they separated from Israel all the mixed multitude. Now, not only was it the Moabites and the Ammonites, but all who were Gentiles, probably their Gentile wives and their children. It doesn't mean that they kicked the wives and the children out of the house, but that they were looked upon as non-Israelites and were not entitled to the privileges of the Jews. So don't get the idea that when it says here, when we talk about the purifying of the people, what Nehemiah is, is saying here is that we need to cleanse the cleanse out, purge out anything that isn't Jewish, anyone that's not Jewish. So they were they were getting rid of Gentile wives and Gentile mix a mixture of Gentile and Jewish children. So it says here, now it came to pass when they had heard the law. That what do they do? They separated from Israel all the mixed multitudes. Anyone that wasn't Jewish was, was to be separated from the Jewish nation, from the Jewish people. And it, but it does, listen, don't get the idea that it means they were just, you know, kicked out of the house, the wife and whatever, two or three or four kids were kicked out and said, you know, I have a wonderful life. I hope you make it. And, uh, you know, I hope somehow you find money and stuff like that. <laughs> it wasn't like that at all. Provisions were made to take care of the wives and the children. Uh, but the men that had married them who were Jewish, they had to not have contact with them anymore. They couldn't have relations with them anymore, their, their wives and their children. They were to be separated from them. And, and this is what it means by the purification of the people. How often do we take stock, listen, do we take stock of our own life? and separate ourselves from all the worldliness that ha that creeps into our hearts daily. We all listen, as Christians, we also need to need daily cleansing. This was a tough job for Ezra and Nehemiah. Remember, Ezra is still alive at this time. Ezra is still very active as, as to what's going on here in, in this chapter. So remember, marriages have been made. There's love between the priests and the Levites that married these that married these Gentile women. There's love between the, the families also with the kids. So this was not an easy decision that to be made because bond, bond, uh, unions were made between, between men and women, between children and parents. So, and now all of a sudden you come in and you say, we have, the, our nation has to be purified. This is what God said. And now you look across the table and you have an Ammonite wife and you've got, you know, three children with her and now the law says sorry you got to separate from them and 
So this was this was not an easy thing. Don't think that this was that this happened like you know uh, very quickly. I mean, it happened quickly, but don't think that there weren't hard feelings and uh, with with people there because it it affected them greatly. So they took care. They didn't just kick kick them out and say you know fend for yourself. No, they had to separate from them. But it's believed that there was provision made for these wives and for these children and to take care of them. Because back then, if you didn't have a husband who worked and you were a woman, you didn't have a husband that worked and children, you, you didn't make it. You, it was, you just could had no way to provide money and food and things. You, you didn't have money to go out and buy a field. As a woman, we wouldn't have money to go out and buy a field and and grow barley or grow corn or something and make money from it. It was just no way. So provisions had to be made for them to take care of them when they separated themselves from them. Now, in next lesson, we're going to start verses 4 through 9, which is the purifying of the temple. All right, the purifying of the temple. But until then, walk with the Lord. I know he walks with you.